thank you. First, uh, yeah, thanks to all the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Um, you've heard a talk this morning on uh, nonlinear dynamics. That was an excellent overview of the theory uh, of this field. And so what you'll hear now uh, is the experimentalist approach. So, so a different approach to the same, same uh, problem. Uh, and I've shortened significantly my uh, uh, introduction. Uh, but again, do, do ask questions if I've omitted something that, um, uh, that I shouldn't have omitted. So um, uh, just to kind of remind you, and again, I won't go into the details uh, uh, of this because this was already covered this morning, but to remind you, the system, the auditory system, is incredibly sensitive. The 0.3 nanometer displacement sensitivity, uh, typically when I speak to physicists outside of this field about this, at some point their reaction is always, that's just not possible. We shouldn't be able to hear. <laughs> uh, uh, and yet, obviously, it is possible. In fact, we do hear. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, the reason being, remember, this is not in ultra high vacuum. This has not been cooled down to 10 millikelvin. Uh, this is squishy biological tissue that's operating at room temperature or higher, uh, and it's immersed in a fluid, right? So this is not something that you think of as an amazingly, you know, ang angstrom sensitive uh, uh, level of detection, right? This is, this is mind boggling in many ways. Um, uh, again, uh, I will skip the introduction except to show a movie. Since I come from UCLA, we're so close to Hollywood, you have to include a movie in your, uh, uh, in your presentation. Now, there's not too much action, but, but this is the best I could do. Uh, this is provided by Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and you can see uh, some of this is not connection, connected to sound, but my laptop will hopefully be loud enough. Um, sound comes into the ear canal, uh, deflects the eardrum. That momentum eventually gets transferred to the cochlea. If you unfurl and look inside, there are the uh, fluid-filled compartments, and in between is this elastic uh, basilar membrane. And so when you hear a sound, it's hopefully audible uh, back there, different parts of this uh, cochlear partition are deflected. So this is where it gets a little cheesy, but hey. <laughs> Again, hopefully this will uh, serve instead of coffee. Um, to wake people up a little bit. So this is what's happening as you're listening to something like this. Of course, vastly exaggerated amplitudes, uh, but different parts of your uh, cochlear partition are vibrating, each one corresponding to a different tone. So there's a spectral decomposition happening uh, uh, as you're listening to, for example, the fugue. <laughs> uh, so I'll let this finish shortly. Uh, there. So that's all the introduction on human hearing I'm going to do uh, because uh, the experiments we do are very invasive, so we need a model system. The model system we use is the frog, and so there are a number of reasons why we use the frog. <laughs> this is one that, again, I found uh, somewhat amusing. Uh, this is a quotation from Linnaeus, uh, and actually, again, I won't read that for you. <laughs> you, can, you can do the reading. Uh, he's actually wrong at the very end, uh, um, that there are not many of them. He's wrong about that, since uh, what's known now is that it's one of the most numerous species on the planet, actually. So. Well, there are, in fact, many of them. And no, the real reason why we're using them is that the uh, organs from, uh, from the frog, and one in particular that I'm going to show you next, are very robust. They're mechanically robust, so they can lend themselves to, um, to the kind of experiments that we want to do. So here's an image of the sacculus. Uh, that's primarily a vestibular organ. Uh, it's for ground-borne uh, uh, vibrations, primarily, but also for low-frequency airborne. So it's vestibular and hearing organ. Uh, this is a top-down view, and each of those uh, white dots that you can see is a hair cell. Uh, so I should say also, we also have sacculi. The uh, mammals have sacculi as well. In, in uh, mammals, they are almost exclusively vestibular. Uh, so it's, it, there is a, uh, a, an organ like this in species other than frogs. Uh, this is a hair cell. You've seen a bunch of those. And again, I'm not going to go over the mechanic, mechanoelectrical transduction. Uh, the only thing I want to do is remind you that um, what happens uh, when these stereocilia are deflected and these channels open, that you also get an elongation. As they open, you get an elongation of the tip link. That this, this elongation, I'm sorry, not an elongation. You get an opening of the channel that leads to relaxation of the tip link, really, uh, which allows the bundle to move back and forth. Um, this gating is what leads to that nonlinearity uh, that you've heard described this morning. And this was shown experimentally uh, by Pascal, uh, Pascal Martin in 2000, how this nonlinearity that's measured in the force displacement dependence leads to the spontaneous oscillations. So 
what can we now do with this system to try to explain some of the still uh, very much open problems in this field. Uh, and as, as Frank has mentioned earlier, uh, uh, incredibly little is still known about how this works. The sensitivity I have already mentioned, and he described in detail the robustness, the dynamic range of, of many orders of magnitude uh, that the system can show. Uh, and so one of the things we're working on is to try to understand both of these limits. So how can the same system uh, that is so very sensitive to very quiet sounds, very, very low amplitude uh, mechanical stimuli also withstand um, very, very uh, strong stimulation. Uh, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the biophysical mechanisms, or at least this is uh, one of the things we're exploring is not only does it do this and how can we explain it with mathematical um, equations, but also what might be some of the underlying uh, biophysical pr principles. So that's sort of the global view. So now let me tell you a little bit about the experimental techniques. I've shown you the preparation we use, it's a sacculus. Uh, everything I will show in this talk is from the sacculus, but again, other systems do show uh, spontaneous oscillations as well. Um, so first of all, we, we are in the basement of a physics building, uh, so we have something like a meter of concrete underneath us. Uh, this is important because you want to isolate your experiment from or your experimental setup from any external vibrations. Uh, you want to be able to measure nanometers of movement. Uh, so then we have acoustic isolation booths, an optical table inside with a microscope, so everything is going to be imaged optically. Uh, I showed pictures uh, that I liked on micrographs because they're pretty, uh, but to be able to measure living functioning cells, we need to leave them immersed in a fluid. The fluid is oxygenated, so we cannot uh, freeze it, dry it, etc. So we are uh, limited to using uh, optical microscopy techniques. Uh, and then the workhorse uh, of the recording system is the uh, high-speed camera. This is a high resolution, high speed. And so this uh, camera allows us to track in principle a, a number of different bundles in parallel uh, for the experiments that need that uh, um, capability. Uh, and of course, uh, as well as tracking just one, if we zoom in, uh, then we can track just one uh, at very high speeds. So. Now that's the recording device. The um, biological preparation is put in a two compartment chamber so we can mimic uh, the solutions that they would be seeing, these hair cells would be seeing in vivo. So it's an in vitro preparation. Uh, uh, the, the tissue is taken out of the animal, but the, the cells are still very much functional, so we have about a few hours to, to measure them uh, before they run down. So we think that this is a very good approximation, we hope, uh, to what the cells would be seeing in vivo. Uh, how we then uh, uh, do the recording, this is a top-down uh, view of the bundle. So you can see it's now uh, blurry because this is an optical, uh, optical microscope image. But prior experiments have shown that uh, even though you can't track any of the individual stereocilia, that doesn't matter because they move in parallel to within sub-angstrom uh, uh, resolution. So we can treat it as one object that's moving back and forth. Uh, and so we, do a, we record a film of, of their motion. Uh, we slice through uh, in a number of different positions, fit to the intensity profile. So what we're focusing here is precision of our measurement, not resolution, right? which is basically pinpointing uh, the center of gravity, the center of mass uh, of, uh, of the bundle in each frame, and then we plot that versus time, and that's how we extract these recordings. So here's another movie. Uh, again, uh, not, uh, not too much action going on, but the bundle is oscillating back and forth. Uh, at a large enough amplitude that you can see it. The color is, this is false color, the red is tall, blue is short. What are the lateral dimensions? Uh, so it's about, so you can actually see that here it's about plus or minus 50 nanometers, order of magnitude. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's pretty typical. We'll see something like 100 nanometer peak to peak as the most standard uh, oscillation. So this is large. This is uh, not, you know, something uh, that you would expect, say, from a passive system, which is just buffeted by thermal motion. Thermally, it should be a couple of nanometers just to give you, give you a, a feeling for um, what a dead, uh, a, a dead cell would be doing versus a live one. Okay, so the, the other thing we can do with this camera, I already mentioned we can scan across, let's say that we wanted to look at different parts of the saculus, uh, and in any one recording we can get 10 to 20 cells in a field of view, so sometimes this, uh, this is an important uh, um, tool to have. For mechanical stimulation, I'll actually tell you about one of the more recent techniques that we're using. Uh, this is just, uh, uh, but, but in, the, in the first set of experiments, this is, this is the old-fashioned technique. We pull some uh, flexible glass fibers 
uh, we mount those on a piezoelectric stimulator and we just attach that to the bundle to push it. So it's a very simple, uh, simple idea. Uh, it's sort of like a similar idea to an AFM cantilever but homemade so that we can get it under the microscope and then parallel to the preparation and attach to the cell. So this is a mechanical stimulation and what it does is if, if we've detached, we've taken off the overlying membrane in this case uh, so that we can uh, stimulate one cell at a time. Right? So we're mimicking what sound would be doing to this cell uh, in vivo. Okay, so this gets me to the first uh, uh, part of the talk. And I'm going to launch right into um, uh, uh, the main sort of uh, a point of, or, or main point of the first set of measurements, which is we wanted to look at how exactly these spontaneous oscillations entrain. So Pascal Martin had shown that they can amplify, that if you send a very weak signal uh, to a noisy, spontaneously oscillating cell, uh, the, the weak signal can phase lock it. Uh, and so we wanted to study how exactly does this phase locking happen, and particularly uh, in the regime where the stimulus sent uh, uh, is small. And so here's a zoom in of how in different regimes the, the cell uh, phase locks. So if you send uh, I should say also here things have been scaled uh, to be comparable just so you can see uh, stimulus sent which is shown in black versus the oscillation which is shown in red um, but there but actually the signal is much weaker so that it's just been scaled for, for, for visibility um, if you send a signal right at the frequency of the cell right at the natural frequency uh, the, the cell synchronizes to the signal very well very easily I should say uh, if you're way off, it doesn't, so if way off to the side uh, that I'm not showing, uh, it ignores it completely if you're sending it at a very different frequency. And so in between, there's a region that shows these uh, phase slips. So it'll be entrained for some number of cycles and then it slips by 2 pi. Either it goes ahead or, go, or falls behind with respect to the signal. So these phase slips uh, are a well-known phenomenon in condensed matter. They've been studied a lot in Josephson junctions, in mercury film, a number, number of systems. Um, but, and so we were kind of uh, excited to see this now in a biological system uh, because we could flip through some of the old literature and, and see what can we learn about, uh, about this system by looking at the phase slips. So we then wanted to say, okay, let's, in order to understand, oh, so this gave us a first hint, I should say, that there may be other bifurcations besides the Hulp bifurcation that you heard about this morning uh, lurking somewhere in the phase space. Uh, uh, of the, the, the dynamics that uh, the hair cell can exhibit. So we said, okay, let's just look at the whole range of, um, or I should say whole physiologically relevant uh, range of stimuli. And so we varied the frequency uh, and the stimulus amplitude, like I said, over roughly the range that uh, a saccular hair cell more or less cares about. Uh, and so what we're plotting here is the phase locked component of the signal. So note, the bundle is spontaneously oscillating at just about the same amplitude here as it is here, or here even. Uh, maybe by this point it's getting, getting increased a little bit. Uh, but generally these are, these are large oscillations. The, 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 the bundle is oscillating a lot, but here it's completely ignoring the signal. So this is not amplitude of movement. This is just the phase locked component at the um, stimulus frequency sent. And so that's the, what the plot shows here. And you can see this uh, uh, sort of triangular shaped region. Uh, again, red means uh, very phase locked. Blue means not phase locked at all. And um, this shape is typical. It's referred to in dynamic systems literature as Arnold tongue. And in principle, you can see uh, more of them. This is just the one-to-one -one, uh, uh, mode locking. So according to previous slide, Again, the part that we're particularly interested in is this transition at the weaker stimulus amplitudes. Uh, and we've sent some much weaker than this even in some systems. Uh, we really care about this regime here and here. Uh, how do things phase lock at very weak amplitudes? And that's the regime that shows phase slips. And so we wanted to see what kind of bifurcations can one expect. So now here I'm showing you the same equation that you saw earlier this morning. This is the so-called normal form equation for the hop bifurcation. And now I want to clarify something that can be confusing in terms of the jargon. There isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between equations and bifurcations. So hop is a bifurcation. Hop bifurcation is a type of a bifurcation. The normal form equation for the hop bifurcation, sometimes people will refer to it as the hop equation, but uh, that's sort of shorthand. Th that means that it's the simplest equation that will support a hop bifurcation. 
There are many other equations that will also show the half bifurcation, right? So this is just the simplest one. Uh, the other thing that may not be obvious is that if you take this very same equation and look at a particular regime of it, this same equation will support other bifurcations as well. So like I said, no, there isn't a one-to-one -one equation to bifurcation. Right? Uh, and in fact, what we wanted to see is uh, if we take this, uh, this equation, which has been shown to explain so much of the data uh, uh, in many systems, including the mammalian, uh, and then look at a particular regime of it. If you look at, again, the whole phase space and vary this control parameter, uh, we're using a different symbol for the control parameter. Mu is now the control parameter. Uh, different symbol, same idea. Um, and plot the response. This is in uh, sort of scaled, uh, scaled units. Uh, and then ask what kind of bifurcations do we see? Right. So this is a well-known phase diagram, all we did was simplify it, essentially. Uh, but what we see is, uh, in a regime shown in black, these lines uh, correspond to the so-called so SNCC bifurcation. What that means is saddle node on invariant circle. SNCC, it sounds like some uh, Dr. Zeus character saying SNCC, but uh, uh, it, it is, in fact, a serious acronym. Uh, what, what that bifurcation does, uh, it's a type of what's called infinite period bifurcation. There's a whole class of infinite period bifurcations. And it means that as you go from limit cycle, from oscillation to quiescent, uh, you cross, over, cross that bifurcation by with uh, at the same amplitude of oscillation. So the amplitude of oscillation doesn't change, but the oscillation slows down. So you have the, the period diverges. Uh, and as it goes to infinity, uh, you reach uh, the, the quiescent state. So that's different from the supercritical hop uh, which you heard about earlier, there as you cross from limit cycle to quiescent, you reduce the amplitude continuously. So these are just, this is a very simplified uh, version of the distinctions there. There's a lot more to be said, but this is one of the, these are some of the signatures, how you can tell, for example, whether you're more likely to be uh, measuring a hot bifurcation or, uh, or the snake bifurcation. Uh, and in between, so the hot bifurcation is shown in yellow, uh, uh, the SNCC in, in black, and uh, where they cross is called so-called bogdanov tokens uh, There you see both. You see both an amplitude modulation and a frequency modulation. So the regime, again, the regime we wanted to focus on is right this regime here. Why? Because uh, we're interested in what happens at the most sensitive regime, right? What happens when you send really, really weak signals? So we started off with something, this is now uh, less than a nanometer uh, in amplitude, so something actually, I, I speak in uh, nanometers, but probably should be talking in force, uh, uh, force magnitude sense. So this is about 0.1 or 0.05 uh, piconewtons, so very, very weak forces. Uh, and we, in, at those levels, if we send uh, a signal, you can't really tell. You look at a, a spontaneous oscillation, you send a really weak signal, and you look at that trace, it doesn't look any different than without signal. But if you send many of them, so uh, multiple repetitions, multiple presentations. If you average us, ah, so I should say we're not presenting anything for two seconds, then we're presenting a signal from two to four, uh, and then not presenting anything from four to six. And in the average response, you can kind of see something starting to emerge, right? There's a sign of life. But still, I would kind of make a face at that, at that uh, <laughs> record, right? This is not, there's not, nothing there, or at least it's very weak. Uh, but if you look at the face, so now that we're plotting, uh, it's the phase difference uh, modulo pi, uh, or in units of pi, I should say. Uh, it's the phase difference between the signal and, uh, and the hair bundle. And then, because there are many presentations, we can do each slice is kind of a histogram. It's a probability distribution um, uh, shown in, uh, uh, in color code. Uh, and so you can see it's pretty much uniform when there is nothing presented, which means that the phase is totally diffusing. There's no, um, no phase locking whatsoever. And then this has become condensed, right? There's a, there's a, uh, the colors are not optimal to see the <laughs> green, uh, green pointer. Um, so in this regi region, from two to four, you can see that there's a condensation, right, if you will, in uh, regime over which the phase will diffuse, right? So there's clearly some information and some degree of phase locking that's happening even at this really weak signal. Uh, with an increase a little bit, this is now a couple of nanometers, two nanometers or so, um, we increase just a little bit the, the amplitude sent, and so now this is the same type of idea, but uh, it's being presented the whole time, and what we're plotting is the unwrapped phase. Um, so uh, each time, and now this is just to confuse you, this is now in units of two pi. <laughs> We've changed the units. Uh, I don't remember why we did that, but there was probably a profound reason. Um, and so again, what you can see here is now even a little bit stronger. You can see a staircase structure, right? There's a cascade, but you see little plateaus occurring, right? Yellow is the, um, 
uh, is higher, right? It's a stronger signal, higher probability than, than red. Uh, and so you can see if you stare at it uh, uh, enough, and we, we've stared at it a lot, um, that there are plateaus emerging. So there are, again, regions where the signal phase locks better to the, to the signal, and then, and then it skips in between. So now we're going to keep up, and now we're going to look at one trace, so rather than this probability distribution, we're going to look at one trace, and we're going to increase slowly the uh, amplitude of the signal sent. So at a very weak signal, again, this is unwrapped phase difference. Uh, it looks diffusive. There's nothing happening. But as you increase the, uh, the amplitude, you start to see a structure emerge, something that looks like it has steps. Those are the phase slips again. Uh, and finally, at the end, you're, well, I guess there's still one little phase slip, but for the most part, you're, you're phase locked. So this all adds up to uh, 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 an emerging sort of uh, um, first part of the story. Uh, and that's now we wanted to model this. Uh, of course, once you, you've done the measurements, you want to come up with what's the simplest equation that can capture uh, uh, your data. This is when a physicist thinks they've understood everything, is when you have the data, and then you have an equation, and you do a simulation based on that equation, and it looks the same. Right? Then we say, check. <laughs> right? Now we understand what's going on. Uh, OK, not quite. But, but this is the first step in understanding. So there's the so-called Adler equation. This is an equation that tells you how does the phase difference evolve with time. It depends, delta omega is the difference in frequencies, frequency of the cell and frequency of the signal. Um, epsilon is some sort of dimensionless uh, force amplitude, uh, 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 sine is sine, sine of the, the phase uh, difference. Uh, and then eta t, is, we added some noise. Uh, and that noise is assumed to be Gaussian. Uh, here again, I want to say that this is not really a different equation than the one I showed you before. The, so the, the normal form equation for the hop is in no, or this is in no way in contradiction to that equation. In fact, this is really, uh, you, could, you could call it almost a special case uh, of that equation. If you take, let me go back actually. If you take that just so you're staring at the equation. If you take this equation, so z, remember, is a generalized position parameter, right? That's a, that's a complex number. If you express that uh, as some sort of r times e to i phi, you express it as an amplitude times e to i phi in a phase, uh, and you decompose those terms, you'll get two equations, right, uh, 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 with a little bit of algebra. And then if you say you're in this regime where um, the amplitude of the oscillation is really not affected at all by the uh, in, uh, applied stimulus, uh, then you can fix r, so you've dropped one of the equations, and all you have left is the equation in phi, then you get, you guessed it, the Adler equation. So you could argue that this is, uh, like I said, a special case of that normal form equation, but this is now far from, uh, far from criticality. So mu is uh, way off from the critical value, and the system is, is deeply in the oscillatory regime. Uh, and so this is the simulation that we did based on this, and at least qualitatively we could say, okay, this looks, uh, looks the same, right? looks very similar. Uh, but what's nice about the Adler, as I said, it's, it's been studied well because it describes uh, a number of other systems, so there, there's, there's rich literature on this. Uh, and people have calculated what should be the, um, the phase locked component um, of uh, the, the oscillator, I want to say hair bundle oscillation, but whatever your oscillator is, what is the phase locked component uh, given a particular forcing term and given temperature. And so this is the, there's an analytical solution of uh, I is the modified Bessel function. Uh, and so if we plug in uh, uh, our forcing term and we know the oscillation amplitude uh, over our data, this looks like it captures very nicely uh, this regime. And again, we're still looking at, at a pretty uh, low amplitude uh, uh, regime of the response. So we were pretty pleased to say that, OK, I th we think we understand everything. Haha, <laughs> We can write down the equation uh, that tells us how uh, things evolve. So let me pause here for a second. Um, OK, so we see phase slips, but then you could say, so what? Let's now bring it back a little bit to, to biology uh, and remind ourselves what is the question we're trying to answer, which is why is the system as sensitive as it is? So what are these phase slips? You know, are phase slips a, the, a means of detecting a signal? Doesn't, or maybe that's a means of no longer detecting a signal. What, what, is, what, uh, what does all of this do? And so to, to bring it back to the biologically relevant question, how might the system be amplifying in vivo? Uh, we looked at, and this is now going back to some of our older work a little bit, uh, what do these cells do when you leave the membrane on top? 
So this membrane has what look like bubbles in the membrane. Here we're, we're, we're leaving the oolithic membrane on top, we're looking through it to image the bundles. And when you leave the membrane there and you image the, the hair bundles, they do not spontaneously oscillate. The cells are quiescent. You then take off the membrane and they start to oscillate. So we have a positive control that they're not just dead to begin with. So clearly the presence of the membrane actually suppresses this oscillation. Uh, now, it can do this by any number of ways. It's coupling them, it's loading them. But one of the things that it's doing is it's clearly, or at least I should say, in vast number of cases that we've seen, it seems to deflect the bundles. So there's, there's a kind of a cavity or a small uh, bubble in this um, membrane, and the cells are normally attached to one side of it, right there. Uh, in hundreds of cases that we've looked at, that's what they look like. And then there were only two cases where they actually did oscillate under the membrane, and those looked like they had just gotten detached, basically. They were sitting in the center of this bubble in, in, as opposed to the side. And so this gave us the idea that maybe what, one of the things that the, uh, the, the membrane is doing is kind of preloading these bundles that are actually a little bit deflected uh, away from where they would like to be sitting. Or at least this gave us the idea that we should look at offset as one possible uh, I say this cautiously, one of the possible control parameters. We still do not know what's a control parameter mu, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that uh, uh, in the next part of the talk. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to look at is how about if we just take now an individual hair bundle and we apply an offset to it. So kind of mimicking what may, may be happening uh, uh, due to the membrane. So here we're imposing slow ramps uh, on the uh, oscillating cell. This gives you, gives you an idea uh, uh, of the sort of geometry of this, and we're applying different rates. So we can deflect it slowly, we can deflect it quickly, we can let it recover slowly or quickly. Uh, we varied this, and of course, this is consistent uh, with what we've seen before with that uh, a phase diagram with a number of different bifurcations. If we go really slowly, uh, that looks a lot like a snake bifurcation. So this is sort of a classic uh, infinite period esque bifurcation. Here it looks like you get a little bit of a, a modulation of uh, amplitude as well. Although it's hard to say. There's just one, uh, one data point with a smaller uh, amplitude. But hey, if I had to make a call, I'd call this the Bogdanov-Takins. Uh, the recovery here is, again, a, a little bit uh, Bogdanov-Takins-ish, whereas this I would probably call supercritical hop. Uh, uh, you can't really you know, look at this and say it's this bifurcation or that based purely on the amplitude. You'd have to dig. Uh, a, a little bit more into uh, the dynamics, but, but what this does imply is that you get different bifurcations within the same cell, but just how quickly or slowly you cross this, um, you apply this input. And so we decide, okay, let's focus on the really slow regime. What if we go to the basically DC case, or so slow that it's steady state? Uh, and we look, also wanted to look at it in a positive direction more, uh, because that seems to be the direction in which uh, at least many of the cells that we looked at seem to be deflected. So now apply really slow, again, uh, 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 practically DC uh, offset. And sure enough, you see the suppression of oscillation. And what we see in this regime is that as you approach uh, suppression of oscillation, you see the spiking regime. So the, 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 the system is at that point mostly quiescent, but once in a while it does a very uh, quick and short excursion from the quiescent state. Uh, and here we've just zoomed into a couple of different regimes. Now this is with subtracted ramp so that it's, it looks flat. Uh, and so that's the spiking regime. And then we studied, okay, if we go to the spiking regime where it just occasionally spikes normally and even maybe cross into the regime where it almost never spikes, but then apply a very weak sinusoidal stimuli, you can elicit spikes. Spikes occur and they tend to occur if we look at the phase of when during the oscillatory uh, signal sent do they occur, that tends to be at a particular phase of the oscillation. So there's a preferred phase when, um, when they do appear. So any one cycle, here we're showing actually a fairly uh, uh, strong signal, but if you make the signal weaker and weaker, uh, you can start getting only occasionally a spike. So whether a spike occurs or not during any spike is stochastic, it's random, but when it does occur, it occurs at a particular phase. And so we started to model this. This is now, uh, again, um, uh, Adler equation, but with an additional term that's brought about by this offset that we're applying. And this additional term actually brings a significant complication into the physics, or at least the math, the calculation part. Um, if one models this Adler equation that's also known in, in the literature as the tilted washboard potential for um, 
I don't know how many physicists did any washing, but apparently this is what washboards look like. Uh, and so if you take a washboard and tilt it, um, uh, you get, this gives you the energy profile. And so this is actually, I, I like this because it's intuitive. What happens when the system is uh, uh, quiescent, it's in one of these, uh, if you've suppressed them, they're sitting uh, uh, in one of these uh, regimes and then they can uh, do a two pi slip. So a spike means hopping from one to another. Uh, in in uh, different, uh, if it was in the oscillatory state, you could say this was the, the minimum would be phase locked and then when it phase slips it uh, 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 drops into the next uh, well. And so, but what this uh, uh, term does, what the offset does, is it gives you actually a modulation of this uh, amplitude of this uh, uh, barrier. And if you do the calculation, this is now a calculation of uh, rate of spikes. Uh, the, the theory does predict uh, this preferential phase and right around the, the 3 pi half, which is what we see. So again, we think that we, are, we understand this reasonably. And one of the things that we really like is what comes out of Now we could go to the numerical model. Uh, and ask something that's not so easy to ask of our uh, um, uh, of the experimental, which is what if you had a whole lot of um, hair, hair bundles um, here considered uncoupled, and you send the same signal to all of them. So if you look at uh, a, a whole bunch of an ensemble of hair bundles sending the sa same signal to them, what is the ensemble response of the whole system? So any one. Uh, is here showing, so, so a spike is shown as, uh, again, it's a, it's a phase slip. So, so same, same uh, uh, mathematics as before. If you're looking at phase locking to uh, not, that transition of, uh, from phase locking to a phase slip uh, in the os oscillating state is the same thing as quiescent and then a spike, right? A spike is a two pi phase slip from quiescent state. Um, so I, I'm speaking of spikes here, but the same, same would apply. Uh, to phase slip. So we, we plot those and any one cell, like I say, is not a very good detector because sometimes it spikes, sometimes it doesn't. You look at any one of these traces, uh, the red or the blue or the black, um, you couldn't tell if you were just getting that readout. You can tell that something's happening, but you couldn't tell, for example, the frequency of the oscillator. However, because there's a preferential phase, if you plot a whole lot of them, you can see that uh, uh, there's sort of uh, lines that emerge uh, uh, in this, like a checkerboard pattern. Uh, and so the whole ensemble will actually encode what the frequency is of your oscillator. And so now this is not at all a frequency selective mechanism. So this would not apply to cochlea. This is, this is modeling the sacculus, which is a very sensitive, extremely sensitive and broadband uh, detector. And so we think that this is actually a plausible uh, model for how the sacculus might work. Um, the other thing we now wanted to say, okay, what about now going back to the question that we were asking before, which is what about sensitivity uh, of the system? Uh, how do the spikes help make the system sensitive or do they? Uh, and so here's another uh, uh, measurement uh, that's a more recent one. And so we're sending again, there are periods of no signal and then a sinusoidal wave and then no signal and sinusoidal wave. What I've taken out of this is that uh, there are under a ramp as well. So we're suppressing, there's a slow ramp that's suppressing the oscillations. And so we can ask what is uh, let me just check if I, yeah. Uh, and so we can look at one of these and try to figure out what is the quote amplification of the system. Um, and one way that we can do that here is sort of knowing what this extreme um, deflection in the positive direction does, which is it essentially opens all of the channels. We can then say when the channels are all open and you're pushing them further in the positive direction, the system is essentially passive. Whereas if you're pushing them in the negative direction, they can, they can close and reopen. That requires an active, uh, uh, an active process in the system. In fact, we show that there's a net active work done uh, uh, over the course of an os oscillation if it contains a spike. Uh, but the positive deflection, it just seems to kind of follow, you can even see that it just kind of follows the signal. Uh, it's vastly unlikely uh, at these levels of, uh, of deflection that there's anything else happening. Uh, so we think that it's at least a pretty good approximation to what a passive response would be. So we can decompose uh, this into sort of passive response and spike. Right. And uh, uh, if we plot that, the spike amplitude remains fairly constant uh, over a whole range uh, uh, of stimuli sent, whereas the quote passive response and, and really just positive phase of, this, of the response tends to go linearly, which one would expect from a passive system. 
So we can say there is some sort of, it's not really a gain. Uh, uh, we, we keep uh, using a different term for this each time we plot this, but we think it's some sort of an amplitude, ampl uh, um, amplitude enhancement, really, or amplitude uh, uh, gain. It's a specific type of gain which we're just defining to be uh, spike amplitude, uh, a distance that the, the system moves uh, 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 during the spike over this passive amplitude. Uh, and we routinely get tens and in some, uh, in the extreme, the best case we've measured 100 uh, fold gain. So we think, this is kind of a, a, a short summary of everything, uh, the picture that's emerging again for the saculus is that we think that in the real situation we're not in the oscillatory regime but we're poised uh, uh, in, the, in the quiescent regime, we think that in that regime the system can spike and that those spikes are probably the amplification or can serve as an amplification mechanism of the incoming signal. We th since those spikes tend to occur at a particular phase, if the whole ensemble starts spiking uh, in unison, uh, that could in fact encode uh, the frequency uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the signal sent. Uh, and the relevant verification for the low amplitude regime we think is the proximity uh, that it's the snake, that the system is in the proximity uh, of the snake verification. So that's kind of the end of first part of the talk. Uh, I've divided the talk up so it's modular since I never quite know how, uh, uh, how many questions I'll get. So I'll pause here briefly and if not I'll launch to the next part uh, which is response that let's look at the other, uh, the other end of the regime. Let's now say, say how does a single hair cell respond to a loud sound? Of course I say sound but I mean mechanical deflection because we can't really play a sound to, the, uh, to one cell and are there a mechanism by which it can protect itself from there? So now what we're chasing here is signatures of whether the system that's now isolated, remember this is in, uh, these are in vitro preparations, we've cut all the nerves, the brain has been thrown out, uh, so there's no higher order processing here possible. It's not that the hair cells send a signal, hey, this is very loud to the brain. The brain says, ouch, this is very loud, and then send some sort of signal back saying, turn down the mechanism. So the question is, is there something that's already peripheral? Does the detector itself self to or can, can it change its parameter mu uh, in real time or, or what, uh, whatever time scale in response to loud sound? Right? So this is, this is the question that we want to ask. Is it, is it already, uh, is the control mechanism already there uh, uh, in, in vitro in this preparation? Uh, and so here's the sort of brutal experiment we did. Uh, this is this is terrible, right? This is this would be like putting your ear against a jet engine or something. I don't I don't really I don't recommend doing this experiment on your own ear. Uh, so here, because we've taken off the membrane, uh, it wouldn't couple well. We, so we want to see one one uh, bump. Uh, but so this is kicking the living daylights out of this. Uh, and the the thing that I want you to Notice is that as it stops, it's quiescent, and then if we, if you're careful and you see this, okay, hopefully you saw this now, it starts oscillating again. So let's now do a plot of what's happening. So here we're doing this is this is the oscillating bundle at the very beginning. We then present 5,000 cycles, 1,500, and then back. Uh, again to 5,000, so you can see that it stops oscillating, it's quiescent for a while. Uh -huh. I kind of really miss something. Uh, even if you don't have the membrane, why can't you still have the sounds? Uh, you could have the sound, but remember the, the, it's the, the geometry of it wouldn't couple well. So uh, the, these cells are pointing up and down uh, uh, within this tissue. So let's say you play the, the sound, you could deflect the tissue up and down, but that wouldn't do anything to the bundles. You need to have two bundles, two, two membranes shearing with respect to each other so that you deflect them sideways. If you keep enough of the whole tissue there and play the sound, like in viva experiments and so on, then of course it works because you have two membranes with different pivot points, you deflect them up and down, and that translates into shearing motion. All right, so, so uh, one shoulder is one pivot, the other, right? If I'm going to exaggerate again the movements. So you need, you need more of the whole tissue to translate the, lateral, the, the transverse vibration into lateral shearing. I've taken off everything, so nothing, nothing, nothing is coupling these tips of the steering sealer to anything. So they're just waving in the breeze, so you have to, you have to kick them directly. Um, and this is, like I said, only because we've, we, we've uncoupled them, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, does it mean that one of the models is wrong or can it 
No, so that was that was the point. Uh, I mean, wrong. Uh, I think that they're just different regimes of the same the same uh, phase diagram. Uh, it's the same equation uh, that produces the different bifurcations. And so even within the same, and we saw that um, uh, broad uh, uh, Arnold tongue. So I think there is a regime there that we were seeing the hop. And in fact, in, one, in, in the paper, we show, I, didn't, I didn't show that, but uh, if you stimulate it in that regime and you look at the crossing, it, it has all the signatures of hop. Uh, with an uh, offset, even, we can get both, uh, uh, both bifurcations. So I think that both bifurcations are there uh, in the same system, which is not surprising, again, given that they're both captured, even in the, uh, or they're both captured in the math. Uh, and so the question is sort of which regime you're poised near. Uh, the question that's important, so, so you ask an important question, which is, well, which is it in vivo, which is the relevant one, what's the important one? Uh, I'm inclined to think that SNCC is the important one for the sacculus. Uh, because sacculus is not frequency selective. Uh, and so you don't care about the frequency, and SNCC is not a frequency selective uh, bifurcation. So, uh, in fact, it has, you know, by, by tuning the parameter, you change its frequency. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that's, that's my, my inclination for the, the sacculus. For the cochlea already, I, would, I, would have, I, I haven't measured it, but I would bet the other way, because you need a frequency selective mechanism, so uh, HOP would be a much, much better bet. So, the question that I find interesting, and this, this we haven't yet done, but uh, if one starts to look at comparative experiments, so looking at this bifurcations across the species, uh, what's the difference? You know, is it just the control parameter? What's the biophysical mechanism by which you change this? It's easy in math, you just change mu. Or, or, or any, or you know, wh whatever. Uh, you just change one parameter, and you're in a different regime. Or, or, um, uh, but uh, uh, in 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 real life, um, do you have? Is, is each cell capable of all of the bifurcations? And probably the answer is yes. And you just tune something inside uh, to adjust it to one or the other. Uh, the the question we don't know the answer to is: Can the same system sometimes operate in one regime and sometimes the other? Um, Presumably, yes. So I don't know if that's answered your question. The answer is we don't know, but we think that both are and possibly more uh, uh, are there. Yeah. I think there was another hand up there. Uh, what I wanted to show here is just that we suppress the oscillation. Um, and this is weak. I actually have another one. Uh, we suppress the oscillations and then they recover. So A, you're changing the uh, uh, stimulus, so kicking, kicking the cell by a lot, uh, shifted it out of the oscillatory regime and into the quiescent one, then you let it go and let it regain its, uh, uh, let it get, get its bearings back, and it starts to oscillate again. So this is, I think we're watching in real time how the cell, the, the cell detunes its mu parameter uh, from oscillatory to quiescent regime and then back again. Uh, afterwards, we measured a cell. It's not the same cell it used to be. It suffered. <laughs> you can see that this is a wimpier uh, oscillator, but it survived, which is, which is uh, shocking. So then we wanted to repeat this uh, with a slightly more uh, gentle method. So if you just deflect it and hold it there and let it go, we see the same phenomenon. Um, uh, it stops to oscillate, so there's a quiescent regime, and then it recovers. So there it is, it's self-tuning in real, or tuning its control parameter in real time. This is again without any of the higher order processing centers. Uh, so clearly that control mechanism is already operant uh, uh, just in the, in the cell. What can we say about this? We can impose different durations. This was something like 30 seconds, 10 seconds, and 5 seconds. Uh, and the longer we hold it, the upshot is the longer we hold it, the longer it takes to recover. So duration of deflection makes a difference. We're saturating this, so amplitude doesn't. It's, it's already uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, pushed so far. Uh, and then we wanted to see if calcium. So calcium has been proposed, and I think it was mentioned uh, uh, this morning as well. Calcium is one of the potential control parameters. Uh, and so we wanted to see how will it recover in a lower, this is 250 micromolar, so just lower concentration of calcium. And sure enough, it recovers much more quickly. So it seems that the more calcium goes in, uh, the longer it will take to, to recover. So one of the hypotheses we can, we can propose, uh, this we haven't tested yet, but the, what will be consistent with the data we're seeing, uh, is that maybe as you uh, overstimulate, uh, you accumulate too much calcium. So cal there are pumps, calcium pumps that would normally extrude it that they just can't keep up. You accumulate some calcium, then when you let it go, they can extrude this and go back to normal. So it could be just calcium uh, 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 control, if you will, inside the cell that tunes it to one regime or the other. Um, so we have two, so, so far we have two proposed control parameters, right? There's the, the offset that we were imposing, but it would be hard to see how in vivo, how would the cell change its own offset position? 
Uh, it's not impossible, and in fact, calcium and offset could work together because calcium affects stiffness of the hair bundle if the hair bundle is attached to some external link and then changes, let's say calcium changes its stiffness, well then it could actually uh, change its zero point position. Uh, and vice versa, obviously if something imposes an offset that would change the calcium influx. So possibly both of these are at work. Uh, but none, neither of them are terribly satisfying uh, in that, again, you, you have to ask yourself, how is the cell controlling this? Let's say that you wanted now to say, aha, I'm in a quiet environment, uh, uh, let's uh, up the gain, or I'm in a loud environment, let's reduce the gain. How exactly would this work? But, but whatever is affecting it, perhaps offset and perhaps calcium, or most likely both, uh, uh, are playing a role, let's just say, in, in setting the dynamics. So when you talk of damage, do you mean that you have a kind of a physical abrasive damage, or you have like the calcium mediated overstimulation and then damage? So that's actually being still stu studied. If you, if you really kick it hard enough, you're just going to break tiplings. You could even destroy cells. Uh, there, there are diseases that will attack cells. And then, then that is, of course, completely devastating uh, in terms of the, the effect on hearing. So you could damage it completely mechanically, right? Uh, and then, then uh, um, um, uh, the, cell, the cell will die. Uh, however, if you're somewhere in between, if you're just starting to damage, but you're not completely wrecking the, the stereocilia, then you're probably in this regime. And so very likely it is calcium accumulation. Uh, and there's some evidence that even studies how, that it sets up redox reactions inside the cell. Uh, it re re releases free radicals, and then those uh, uh, um, destroy other mechanisms inside the cell. So people are studying this very hard to try to figure out if there's, if there are ways of protecting against damage. So there are a number of labs that are studying. This is, this is an ongoing question, but there is a lot of evidence that calcium accumulation is in fact toxic. Um, so it, it's consistent, yeah. Is there another question? I think this is all I want to say on this um, strong mechanical stimulation, except like I said, it, lead, it points to calcium being important. So now, Part three, control parameter. What do we think it ultimately is? Uh, is of course, well, and, and really I shouldn't call this, con uh, I should say control parameter question mark, <laughs> or two question marks, right? Pro pro and yet another uh, uh, way to dig at what that might be is of course voltage, right? Uh, why do I say that? So in the, um, uh, in the hearing system, the cell, hair cells talk to the brain w via one set of neurons, but there's a whole other set of neurons that goes from the brain to the hair cells. Those are called efferents, and so the brain does control the cells. And so you could imagine that the brain, some part of the center says out too loud uh, and sends a signal back to the cell, and so that would be affecting the voltage of the cells. So we want to see how does changing membrane potential inside affect the, the, the dynamics of the cell. So these are some of our recent recordings. Uh, this is the, the movie camera uh, uh, Im imaging the, the hair cells. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we're recording the electrophysiology of the bundles. Uh, and so here's an example. Now we get simultaneous recording of the oscillation and the current, uh, the current flow uh, into the cell. Uh, convention in this field is that current into the cell is negative. This makes it harder to see the, the, the <laughs> correlation because it's flipped. Uh, so I would have liked to have plotted it the other way, but uh, biologists would kill us if we did that. So I'm too scared to, to try. Uh, I didn't know there would be maybe no biologists in the audience, but hey. Um, so here's, the, again, the oscillation, uh, the mechanical oscillation. There's the uh, electrophysiological recording. I should keep track of time. Uh, and what's interesting, so we see correlation between them. It makes sense, uh, channels open, in, in goes current. Uh, what was interesting that we saw here is uh, that even little tiny blips, which we might have thought was just noise, uh, is, I mean, it, it, uh, what it does, we don't know, but it, even the little tiny blips, so things that are much smaller than the full uh, scale oscillation, they do have a correlate in the current. Um, so, so you have like, a very strong uh, uh, correlation between even like something of this uh, uh, scale uh, has a correlate. So uh, we were able to do these recordings. Uh, I'll skip to see the D, those are, those are sort of uh, controls of various sorts. Uh, but I want to get to the main point, which is then we uh, impose different <laughs> voltage offsets uh, on the oscillation. And so here we're going from minus 90, mi somewhere between minus 60 and minus 70 is probably the natural state uh, of the cell. As we depolarize, we apply smaller and smaller, smaller negative, uh, so I should say higher and higher voltages, uh, smaller in the absolute value, uh, voltages on the cell. 
uh, we suppress the oscillation. Uh, and at around minus 20, the system can no longer oscillate. Right? So this makes sense. Again, this is not in contradiction with the calcium effect. In fact, uh, uh, this may be voltage is probably controlling the cell dynamics by controlling calcium influx. Calcium is charged. Uh, it goes into the cell by electron diffusion. I'm changing the driving uh, force onto this, uh, on the calcium. So less calcium is entering, uh, and we see a suppression of oscillation. Uh, we can't really call the, the, the bifurcation yet. This is something that we have yet to, to study. Uh, again, it looks like the period is affecting, so if, if I had to make a bet, this looks snick-ish to me. Uh, but what we need to do is now model this and really, really try to study what the uh, different bifurcations might be doing. Uh, but what's nice is that, yes, indeed, voltage can serve as a control parameter because that's a more biologically plausible one. Uh, we can ramp this uh, faster. Uh, and so this is a slow ramp. We'll zoom into the uh, region where it's suppressed. And there it is, suppression of oscillations by uh, voltage. We also wanted to look at fa uh, faster response. So we're sending short steps. This is 50 milliseconds. And so one of the things we were also seeing is that uh, at the offset of it, it's always going from the uh, more negative voltage to the more positive. We see this uh, additional uh, sharp movement. We don't quite know what to call it yet, because the, in literature there have been things reported called the twitch, something else called the flick. Since we think that this, is, this may be a third thing yet, but we're not sure uh, whether it's one of these, uh, where we came up with a third name. So currently we're calling it the jerk. Um, but uh, we'll probably have to change that for the publication. So uh, 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 in the lab, we, we call it the jerk. Um, uh, and probably when you, when you read this in the publication, we'll think of something serious uh, <laughs> to call it. Um, uh, but, but we do uh, see this very robustly in, uh, this is now in higher calcium uh, system. And there it is, again, from all kinds of different steps. And what's nice about this jerk is that uh, it shows some weak calcium dependence, but not much. So it's there under various calcium conditions. And there really seems to be now a voltage dependent uh, uh, element, so that there's a purely voltage induced movement. Uh, that's this sharp movement, this slow step that, that's consistent with the calcium effects that we've been talking about. Uh, but this doesn't seem to, to, to be uh, strongly dependent. So we uh, may have yet another uh, possible means by which the voltage could be on a fast time scale affecting the, the mechanics. And this is still very much being, being studied. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just now give you a very short view of some of the current work. Um, much of it is still, is still in progress, but just to kind of show you what, what we're digging at, what are some of the open problems still in the field that we're trying to uh, look at. So I wanted to add a little bit on coupling between cells um, because it was mentioned uh, earlier this morning, theoretically. So one of the ways to look at it is to make a really long probe and one that's sort of funnily shaped so that we can attach it to two bundles. That's, the, you know, n, n equals one, two, three, infinity, right? So we'll start with two. I don't think we can do three. We'll skip the three. So it'll be one, two, and infinity. Um, uh, and so, OK, we start with two. We take two freely oscillating uh, bundles. We couple them. And sure enough, they synchronize. Right, so this is perhaps not shocking <laughs> or not even surprising. But what surprised us is that if we take two freely oscillating bundles that are very different in frequency uh, and we couple them, they still synchronize. And so this is a regime that's uh, uh, in the field one would expect when something is very strongly coupled, and these are, and of very different frequencies, you might get what's called amplitude death, where they, they jam each other rather than synchronizing. Um, and we don't see that. We've never seen uh, it suppressed. In, in any case that we've looked at, whenever we take two hair bundles that are oscillating and we couple them, we get synchronization, however far the, the, the frequency is to begin with. Um, and so this is something we're trying to now understand. Is there some sort of cell learning? Are they affecting each other, tuning each other's control parameters? Uh, uh, or, or whether, um, whether, in fact, we are in the amplitude death regime, and why is that not occurring? Uh, but but the, the experimental finding, like I said, is very robust. We tried this also. OK, so no, I, 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 was, I sold ourselves short. We can, do, we can count to four <laughs> before we skip to infinity. Um, so we can couple now a bunch of different cells with um, uh, an overlying microsphere, so we just drop. Uh, a, a large balloon, actually it's more like a large see-through volleyball, um, onto the, the, the hair bundles. And we can then uh, plot the oscillation of the bead. 
uh, we can also image through it. It's kind of ugly and blurry because we're looking through the, the sphere, but we can see them and track them. Uh, and sure enough, and then we can track a spot, so the imperfection in this see-through bead, uh, to see how it moves. Uh, and sure enough, they synchronize. Uh, occasionally, we get two to one synchronization, but usually we get one to one. So again, this is um, uh, still work in progress, but we find that they, they synchronize, they synchronize very robustly. Um, one of the things we've recently seen, and we're studying this more, is that the oscillations tend to become more regular. The Q factor, if you will, the, the quality of the oscillation improves when you couple them. So you have very noisy oscillators with broad uh, spectrum that gets tighter when you couple them. Uh, we're also trying to look at how the frequencies match. It tends to pretty much average them. You take four different frequencies, and the net one is more or less the mean. Um, so uh, uh, the, the synchronization uh, does work, uh, and we haven't yet looked at how it responds to stimulus, but uh, just from looking at the, what the spontaneous oscillation does, that would seem to confirm that indeed uh, things should become sharper. They, they should get improved by, uh, by synchronization. Uh, and one of the things that's sort of a side effect of this is that wh whatever this active mechanism is, it can move uh, large uh, overlying structures. Uh, and finally, since this is an experimentalist talk, I want to mention one cool new technique, um, which is uh, we want to be able to push these cells faster. And this floppy probe is not good for that because it's, well, floppy. Uh, it has an elastic. Uh, it's very elastic. It has viscous drag. It limits. It's kind of like a mechanical filter on this. So we're in the nanotechnology age. So why not use um, magnetic nanoparticles, uh, particularly when you don't have to make them? So we collaborate with a group. Um, uh, in Korea that makes uh, particles. We, we like these ones because they're cool, right? They're cubic. Uh, no, I'm kidding. They're, they're, those are for reasons not understood. Uh, they tend to have a higher magnetization moment than uh, equally sized sphere columns. So they make these cubic nanoparticles and then coat them with a sticky substance. Uh, the sticky substance uh, is to, well, to connect them to hair bundles. We then have uh, uh, an electromagnetic probe. So you just wind a whole lot of wire over uh, a probe and approach it to the uh, hair bundle. Uh, and so there is the, the schematic diagram, uh, a bead attached to the bundle and then an electromagnet. The probe is still large compared to the bundles. Uh, but this is something that we may actually tweak in the future. There's no reason not to make this. Uh, not to engineer this to be, to be smaller, uh, there's a bundle with a bead. Uh, but then, actually, so that's a bundle. Um, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's the bundle that's actually being stimulated. You can't see here. These, these particles are, are very small. Uh, so we can't necessarily see which one uh, has, or sorry, which bundle has particles attached, except by the fact that it re reacts or doesn't. Uh, we can, however, test generally whether attachment has worked uh, by just labeling them, uh, labeling the particles with fluorescence, labeling the bundles, uh, looking at the overlay to show that uh, particles are indeed attached. We also looked at them uh, on SCM uh, just to prove that it attaches. And then, like I said, you really, what you end up with is just you measure the response. Uh, and we can calibrate the forces um, um, uh, on, on the, the particles. We know what a particular distance from one particle would do. Uh, and then we, we can measure how much uh, uh, the bundle is being deflected. And so we can get estimates from that on roughly how many particles we get uh, on each bundle. Uh, so here, we're just driving it slowly. But the, the, the cool part is we can go up to, so far we've been able to drive it up to about 5,000 hertz. And so this opens up possibilities for actually studying other systems, uh, mammalian systems and so on. Um, so that's, ah, and we wanted to check, does this still work? Do we get mechanical transduction? So we just did some calcium imaging uh, at the same time. Uh, here's a deflection of the bundle. Here's a calcium image, and it works. Are you able to measure an induction current from the natural oscillation through the probe? Instead of uh, actively exciting it, can you also measure the oscillations that way? And can you measure? No, we haven't. So we don't have a feedback on this. You're, you're thinking something like a magnetic trap uh, that would then be able to measure how far you're off? Yeah, I was just, yeah, you're just curious if you can measure a current induced in the coil of your probe. The... We haven't. This isn't set up to do that. This is kind of just a pure stimulus scent, but there are magnetic tweezers uh, out there with, where you then have both a measurement of, 
uh, stimulus you're sending and the force uh, and the feedback from the, 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 the object bead or whatever it is that you're trying to stimulate. And then you, you, have, you have both. We, this setup doesn't, doesn't have that sensitivity. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, upshot is magnetic nanoparticles work. They're a very good uh, uh, tool. And so now we can probe these dynamics at a higher, uh, higher speed. And some of the current results that we're looking at is higher order mode locking. So I showed you one to one, Arnold telling, but one of the things that uh, we can now probe is, is uh, you know, can it mode lock at five to one or four to one and so on. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, thank my current lab members, uh, the postdocs and the graduate students. I showed a lot of uh, work by my recent graduates, uh, uh, Albert and uh, Yutana. The magnetic particles are from uh, 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 Jinwoo Jin Chion's lab, uh, and uh, some of the theory has been done in collaboration with uh, uh, Robin Brunsma's group. Uh, and finally, the, I think the uh, uh, agencies that fund, uh, fund this work. All right, thank you. Right. And for the same reason that oscillations are destroyed by, uh, by, by the stiff or the membrane, it might also destroy the spiking regime. Why would it not destroy the spiking regime? Uh, you have both effects. So we've shown, yeah, if you just put... What's uh, different about the spiking regime? Um, what's different between the, the deflected spiking regime, if you will, and uh, just putting a load on? Now the effect of the load, what would be different for the effect of the load on the spiking regime as opposed as to the oscillatory regime? Uh, I don't expect that it will be any different in the sense that um, what you see, I mean, what you just see with a stiffer probe, let's say you just put a slightly stiffer probe uh, on this and deflect, it just more quickly reaches the suppression. And so there's a more narrow spiking regime, but you still do see the spiking. So if you took it, in, if it's overly uh, stiff, then you probably just wouldn't be able to move it, right? So I, you know, one has to look at the sort of intermediate. Um, but it, it does affect it. Everything gets smaller, right? Oscillations become smaller, the spikes become smaller, but it's comparable. The spike amplitude with everything we've seen is comparable. Maybe it's a little bit reduced, but it's very comparable to the oscillatory uh, in the order of magnitude. Like, so there's, you, you've seen, you know, there's a reduction, but it's comparable. So just everything seems to scale. Uh, now, we haven't looked at the full range. Like I said, you just see some range of stiffness of probes. Uh, and it's hard to know how that compares really to the autolithic membrane. Uh, it's on the order of magnitude. We know estimates of the, the, the stiffness of the membrane, but that's just estimated kind of as patches. Uh, but we don't really know, like I said, it's also coupling and loading. Yeah. So I think it's, it's hard for us to say yet what the full effect uh, of the membrane is. But it wouldn't, uh, uh, doesn't seem to affect the, the spiking regime differently. Uh, than the oscillatory. Just you reach it faster. All right, so thank you. Okay. Thank you.